Hello, gorgeous people, and welcome to another TV Central one-on-one podcast. I'm Aaron Ryan. This is episode two, 2023. Now, Australian Idol is back after last being seen in 2009. Now, after the pre-recorded auditions and cuts, the show will be live. Glad to see a live television back in prime time outside of news. The judges of this season will be Kyle Sanderlands, Megan Trainer, Amy Shark, and international superstar Harry Connick Jr. The show will be hosted by Ricky Lee Coulter and a man familiar with the audition process, Scott Tweedy, who joins me now. Scott, thanks for joining me here at TV Central. Aaron, good to be here. I'm so excited that a piece of Australian TV nostalgia is coming back after 14 years. And it's, it is so exciting. I'll tell you what, when we were on set filming it, there was a buzz in the air. Like everyone was like, firstly, we can't stuff this up. Secondly, this is going to be huge. Well, how do you think they've been doing uh, balancing the nostalgia versus the new generation show? I've seen a few of the uh, auditions and I think they did really well. They opened up with a look back at, at, at 20 years, but then when they got into it, it's, you know, it is a brand new sort of show. Yeah, it's got a new look and feel to it. The shots are just beautiful, but it's raw. They've kept the edit quite raw where it's like when you're walking in or when the contestants are walking into that audition room, there's silence and you can feel the nerves and almost the awkwardness because auditioning in any room and for any TV show or any, I don't know, song, any sort of performance, it's really hard. And so you get that feeling from Idol, but they also polish it really nicely with that energy of like, hey, this is one of the biggest singing contestants, uh, competitions of all time, and this is what it looks like. So, yeah, I think it's a great mix. Why do you think it was uh, now over a decade later to, to bring back Australian Idol? Um, oh, well, like if you want to get down to the nitty-gritty of it, I'd say format rights. <laughs> I'd say a network was probably sitting on it for a while and they let it go, and then another network goes, yes, please, and then we had a pandemic which added another couple of years to that process. I know that I spoke to the execs of Channel 7 probably two and a half years ago uh, when I was living in New York at the time. So, yeah, it's been a long process to get to now the launch of Australian Idol. Yeah. Uh, After many seasons of Idol, AGT, X Factor and The Voice, people always say, surely we've run out of talent, but but clearly we haven't. Is it just that it's a new generation coming through or is it that some people are just not ready at a particular time, but they are now? Perfect mix of both, for sure. You've got to remember Australian Idol is 15-year-olds to 27-year-olds. So they, some of those contestants weren't born when Idol came out. Uh, and then you've got others that might have auditioned when they're 15, 16, 17. They've gone out. They've lived a little. little they've probably gone on some of those other shows as well but got better and now they're ready and they've found their own voice, they've found their own style and they're auditioning and, you know, the judges are like, you're great. So how are the judges gelling at the moment? Is it is all well or is there, a, is there any tension, you know, because sometimes that they might butt heads because of um... – you know, what they see as unique, someone else might see as pretty ordinary? I think we've got the perfect mix of judges. I, and I don't think, no, they don't gel all the time, but they're all completely different human beings. You've got Harry Connick Jr., who's, he is a musical genius. And you can see it in his face when he's sitting there listening. His brain is ticking away. And the feedback he gives, I don't understand it sometimes because he's just saying this musical language, which I don't get, but he does. You got Amy Shark, who's done the hard yards as an Aussie singer. You know, she was gigging at pubs and around the place for 10 plus years until she got her break. Uh, Kyle Sanderlands, who is a master, you got to remember, and as much as people don't like him and he's a shock jock, every morning for 20 years, he's been listening to the hottest tracks from all artists and interviewing all those big stars. So he does know what a hit is and he does know what will make a person into a star. And then you've got Megan Trainor, who right now is a star globally. I reckon we signed her on, or we, I didn't, but the show signed her on Idol at the perfect time because she just released a whole other batch of songs which have gone global and gone viral. So, yeah, she's definitely in a position to call the shots. I've watched a few of the auditions and I noticed that there's especially this little cool, fun vibe banter if you like between kyle and megan did you notice that as well yeah they're they're perfect because you know kyle's cheeky he says what he thinks and megan's like a little schoolgirl that's giggling and i think kyle's the sort of guy when you 
when he gets fed that feedback, he delivers even more. Uh, but she's also, he's, he's never offending anyone and she's also her own voice. So they, they are playing off each other. But he, he becomes the softy too. Kyle, there's moments there where he's cried and he's also, you can tell he's talking from the heart. So he's not just there to be what they call the asshole. He's, he's there to literally find the next Australian Idol. Mm. Hey, I'm wondering if anyone else can um, can get that serial killer vibe out of their minds. I'm referring to, of course, um, Harry Connick. Yeah. Harry, Car- <laughs> he, he played Gerald Lee Callum in, in uh, Copycat with Holly Hunter and Sigourney Weaver. I think you would have been seven when they came out. But uh, there's that serial killer vibe there, isn't there? Who's this, from Kyle Sandilhand? No, no, from, oh, see, that, that's because you were seven years old. Harry Connick Jr. was um, played a serial killer in a movie called Copycat. Um, with Sigourney, oh, yeah. Sigourney Weaver and, and Holly Hunter. And he was a really bad, like, violent serial killer. I can't get that. that uh... oh, I'm going to have to watch this before the live episodes just so I can make this reference because this is great. So he, Harry's a serial killer. Yeah, I can see that. I can't see him killing anyone, but I can see the death stares that he gives uh, to that extent. And when he doesn't like something, he's a, he's a serious guy. You know, he... He's done so many years of playing at some of the most prestigious venues around the world that he he's taking Idol 110% seriously. Yeah. So about the contestants, why do you think Australian Idol can, can help Australia's next, um, will find the next Australia's diamond in the rough? It's a good question. I've got a lot of friends over the years through working at, on The Loop at Channel 10 and now over in America that work for record labels. And a few of them have international positions as well, where their their sole job is to make sure the artists they represent, they're streaming, are getting the numbers they need, and also trending on TikTok. And I was speaking to them about Idol coming back, and they're like, this is so important for such a different reason now. They're like, there's so much noise in the music industry where we as a label can push artists on big TV shows, in radio, but the cut through right now from TikTok is so important for artists breaking through. And they're like, if you've got artists or musicians that are coming on Idol who already, some of them have a bit of a following already because they are so talented, but then use a national TV show to push you even further out into the sphere of of Australia and the world, it's going to work wonders for these musicians. So I, I think a show like Australian Idol does work really well for these artists to make them the next biggest star if they can also write music and sing to a level that the world needs. Yeah. What what would you specifically be looking for if, if you if you were a judge? Well, it's the point of difference. Like someone can have an amazing voice, but if they sound like another 100 people before them or they're exactly like, uh, you know, a guy Sebastian or exactly like a Jessica Marboy, I wouldn't go for them. I'd go for that person that's a little bit more quirky and, and unique because because they're going to be so different. And I think we've definitely got that in our top 50. Yeah, for sure. Um, so what's your best advice like when you're comforting contestants on like whether they're successful or not um, in, a, in an audition? Well, you've got to be in the moment. I think too many of them think too far ahead and it's like, right now you're about to perform a song. You've probably performed this a hundred times before you know, you know this, you're a musician, you're talented. So just go back to the basics and then also breath work. I think that's really important. A lot of them, you know, you can see the tension in their shoulders and they're not breathing enough. So you almost like give them a quick guided meditation when we're there before that door. And it's just like, breathe in, breathe out and just also enjoy this. Like this is a very unique time of your life and a time of my life and all the rest of us and Australians watching it, like enjoy this moment. Well, so you are uh, hosting. What, what exactly is your role uh, with hosting with Ricky uh, when we get to the live shows? Is one of you doing front and one of you at the back or are you actually hosting together? It's gonna, we're going to top and tail the show together and then we're still working that out at the moment. And it's, that's the great thing about a first series is everything that we've done from this series isn't a trial, but it's it's basically like let's put things out there and see what works and what doesn't work and and find our own voice. So, yeah, it's very much a split effort for Ricky and I. Uh, we won't be doing it together the whole time. We're not we're not doing it as a duo. We're not trying to be another James and, and Andrew G um, or, you know, Hamish and Andy. We're not a double act, but we're two people that have 
you know, a lot of experience in this space and we really enjoy the art of music. She comes from such an amazing background of being in the position these contestants have been in. Uh, I've now clocked up a lot of live TV work, so I thrive in that environment of that energy of life. And, you know, things will go wrong and we'll, we're going to lap that up when it does. But also we, we, all, we rehearse yeah. enough. It's, it's a pretty simple show. Like we open a show. We then have contestants sing a song. We listen to the judges. We come back to us. We then make sure that contestant's happy with what happens, get everyone to vote, and then we do that cookie cutter a few times with guests. Like it's, it's a simple format. I read somewhere that you uh, one of your dream jobs was to host Australian Idols. We're not talking two and a half years ago when you were asked. This is years and years and years ago. Is, is yeah. that right? Because that's it's amazing now. 100%. That it. Yeah, it's... It was one of those shows, I, I think I was 14 when Idol came out and just seeing the energy of that live TV and music all coming together, I was for sure like I'd love to host that show. Then it went away, then there was rumours it was coming back. I remember when I was at Channel 10, Stephen Tate was like, you'd be perfect if Idol ever came back, you'd be perfect for a show like that. Then there was another five or six years and then finally the rumours that Channel 7 got it and it was coming back. So it, it had been toying with me a lot in my career. And then once it's just all that timing, right place, right time, right experience, good audition. Uh, it just, it was a perfect match. Wow. That's just amazing. It's just how it's all come together. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you about the, um, the auditions that are like a clearly woeful. So not like the ones that are absolutely terrible that we love. Now I've always been a hundred percent sure that the person at the audition knew um knew that they were bad and it was a bit of a prank um you know because they they just want to get a bit of airtime on tv but then i've seen a few like imogen um in the audition process i mean what do you think the percentages of the people that are actually genuine and think that they've got a great voice and are like a heartbroken they're told they're not and people that are you know it's just a prank i think they're all like that's the problem because i was like well, I was like, I was going. Surely the producers are, you know, getting someone to come in and and to be like. But we spend time with them in that holding room, and then at the door, and then when they come out, and we don't know what they sound like as well. So some of them will come out, and you'll see the producers going, "Oh my goodness, like what happened then?" But we didn't get to hear it. So then we, I do like the back end, and like, you know, talking to them, how did it go? Not well, okay, whatever, whatever. They walk off. And I was like, how was it? And they're like, awful. And I was like, how's that possible? So, yeah, I, it, I think, I don't know, maybe, maybe a few of them were. Like a few rappers came in. And so I don't know if they were, they have never seen Idol or get how it works. But we're not really looking for a rapper for this style of show. Uh, so to answer your question, I don't know. I, I, I'm sure there's some in there that are set up. But I had no inkling at all. And the producers definitely don't tell us if that's the case. But from what I saw, it looked like all of them were wearing their hearts on their sleeves and going in there and giving it their best and then get told no. Wow. Some of them were absolutely convincing. And so people look out for, for especially one that I remember was Imogen. Um, well, hang, well, some of them were, they call themselves vocal coaches. So they're, you know, <laughs> from a small town somewhere. And I would talk about, yeah, and no, I'm a vocal coach. And you're like, amazing. They go in, come out, wouldn't have a golden ticket. I'd talk to the producers to my right, and they're like, oh, they were awful. They, they were no good. And I'm like, who are they teaching then? <laughs> Probably me. <laughs> <laughs> and me too. Um, on the other scale, like some of the backstories of people, um, in the auditions, we have a girl, Sarah Houston. Um, she's the girl that had the, um, I think, the bone marrow cancer when she was little, but then had complications yeah. um, older. Um, it just melts your heart. Um, there's some great sto stories this year on, on Idol, isn't there? Yeah, and they're not forced. Like, that was the weirdest thing. I I've still to this day as well, like, I watched the first episode and going, did someone set this up? Because what happened was her mum was at the airport when we, when we landed in Perth and she was there purely to see Ricky, just to go, hey, listen, my daughter saw you came to the Ronald McDonald house years and years ago great moment, let's get a photo, she's getting surgery today, but blah, blah, blah. And from that it evolved to, oh, she's a singer, bring her along tomorrow. So oh, it was incredible. God. And then she could sing and she was a really good singer and then Harry played with her. So 
you're right. Like I got tears watching that because uh, once again, we weren't in the room to see that. So I only saw it when the rest of Australia sees it on air. And it's, it's a really genuine, beautiful moment, which is a credit to the production. Yeah. Hey, just a few questions about you before we go. Um, I know you've been to the audition process yourself um, with ABC. I think there was 7,000 7, applicants, if, if I read yeah. correctly. Um, what was the process like for you and, and, and how can you relate that to, to Idol? Different in terms of one was for presenting, one was for singing, but very similar. Um, at the time, ABC3 was launching, which is a whole new kids channel. And I used to listen to Triple J a lot. And they were like, we're doing a presented search. We're looking for kids hosts. I was working at Nova Radio at the time on the street team, but I was filming a lot of stuff for them at music festivals. This is when online videos for radio stations was just starting to take off and I could edit and film. So I was filming a lot of the, the radio DJs and then I do all the other artists. So I had this experience, but I was eyeing off Channel V and MTV. I was like, dream jobs, you know, music TV. When I heard of a kid's channel, I was like, I was thinking more wiggles and like more play school. Like, hey, welcome. <laughs> so, yeah, so I was just like, it wasn't for me. Two days before the, entrant, the entries shut, all the street team had put videos in and I was watching a few of my fellow street team videos and I was like, I think I can edit a, a better video. I think I can do a better audition tape than those guys. Ran around for 24 hours, put a tape together. It had to be two minutes or less. So mine was a minute 59, sent it off. And then, yeah, two weeks later, it was like, hey, you've made the top 100. Go to Cutting Edge, which was in Brisbane, like a post-production studio. And I was there with about another 12 people. And we had to do line by line these different scenes and scenarios. First time in my life. I had a big beta camera in front of my face. So I was like, oh, God. But it just came down to be myself. I was 21, but I looked like I was 16. So, you know, hadn't quite gone through puberty to the extent of facial hair or whatever. So I looked the part and just gave a performance being myself. Two weeks later, they're like, you've made the top 15. Can you fly to Sydney? I've been to Sydney once before. So I was like, this is so exciting. <laughs> flew down there and then it was in ABC studios and this was a full day of auditions and casting and once again the nerves but you just got to be yourself it's it's hard to like think past that and just go be in the moment do the best you can and then yeah a week later they were like can you move to Melbourne you've got a job we, we want you to host uh prank patrol it was funny I was actually disappointed because I wanted to host they were looking for two main channel hosts which was Kane and Amberley yeah. and I really wanted that and they're like, no, we want you for this, which for me, it actually ended up being better. Yeah. But yeah, it was incredible that that experience for me. Like just I was studying commerce and economics at UQ, Brisbane at the time, fourth year of uni, working at Nova, and then a week later on set. And I can't, it was, it was like the ultimate apprenticeship for me. I was learning on the job. And I was lucky because the crew were all freelancers that were doing the biggest shows on TV at the time. So just learning from those guys. It is fun watching some, someone's career like yours. I mean, Prank Patrol, and then you've you've been around the world and and uh, hosted E News, and now Australian Idol. You just just about done everything. But with um these auditions, um there might have been a chance that people were auditioning to fall in love with you. Now I'm sorry if my research came from the Daily Mail, but was was being the Bachelor actually a real thing, or or, or was that just all nah, ne never a real thing? That was so bizarre. I'd actually I'd just come off a breakup of living with my girlfriend as well, so it was a five year breakup. So like heartbroken, and somewhere somehow it got out that I was single and then this article came out. And so I was at channel 10 at the time. So I, I was kind of blowing up at, at 10. I was like, who threw me under the bus? Like, what is, because like, absolutely not where I'm going in my career. Being the bachelor is not on that career path at all. And so I, you know, I thought I got stitched up by someone somewhere because in that article, at the very end, it was like, and auditions are now open for the bachelor apply here. So I'm like, this is a publicity thing. And I was the scapegoat for that. Yeah, but no, <laughs> never, there was never one conversation in the network for me to do that job. Well, let me see this one. This could be true. I'll put a few words together. Um, Mardi Gras, Kesha, bum, penis, tattoo, bone crack, glitter. Is, uh, am, I, am I heading anywhere right for that? 
Uh, Kesha bum tattoo glitter separate from Mardi Gras, but they're both true. So my friend worked at Airbnb and he was like, do you want to be on the Airbnb float for Mardi Gras? And I was like, absolutely. I've never been before. Love to do it. You know, a lot of my friends um, are from the gay community. I was like, what a lot of fun. It actually wasn't that fun. And I'll tell you why, because we went to the Airbnb offices beforehand and got our little hot pants on, wigs on and glitter, but we were drinking and we were drinking a lot of beer. And then you go from there down to like the holding area for all the floats and there's no bathrooms. So we were there for like four hours before we actually drove through the streets of Oxford Street and I had to pee so bad. So for me, it was one of the most painful experiences where I've got four beers in my belly and I just had to pee the whole time. And I'm like, yeah, happy about get me to a bathroom. So Mardi Gras was a bittersweet for me. I enjoyed it, but I was like, if I only had bathrooms, it would have been better. <laughs> and, and and there was a, a thing with, was, did Kesha draw a, a Yeah, so it, this is when, you know, we were two years into the loop, having a lot of fun. So I, I had to interview her in a hotel room. And I was like, I brought pens and glitter. And I was just like, hey, in the video clip, you know, you're getting a tattoo, put a tattoo on me. Where do you want to do it? And she's like, I want to do it on your bum. And I was like, okay, let's do it on my bum. So I pulled my pants down enough and she drew a penis on there and then put some glitter down my butt crack. So I was like, and there it is. Thank you, Kesha. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, just before we go back to Idol, um, just so we know how it's working. So the top 50 perform um, and they yeah. get into the top 24. Then I understand that the 24 then become 12 and then we go into that live weekly right. and, and voting each week. Is that is that the process? Yeah. Yeah. So 50 then gets eliminated down to about 32, I think it is. And then the next episode from 32 down to 24. Then from 24, that's when they start getting knocked off to the top 12. And then we start live. And as per previous seasons, will there be themes each week? I don't know, like Australian theme and things like that? Yeah, there will be themes. I'm not aware of what they are just yet. We're going to find out shortly. But yeah, every week we'll have a theme. Oh, and we'll have live performances as well for whoever's in town, uh, which I know booking big acts is hard. Uh, they're touring. They're not then doing publicity. So, but hopefully we get some good ones. I'm not sure of that, who's going to be performing yet. But I just know that Channel 7 are giving this show everything and they're not cutting any corners. Beautiful. All right. Sounds like Australian Idol will be a cracker and TV Central will have some involvement in the show. More on that later. Scott, great work with the auditions. Um, I've seen the first bunch of episodes um, and you're really fostering a great positive vibe there. So good luck with the live shows coming up later. And, and thanks for joining me today. Good to be chatting with you. Thank you so much. All right. Scott Tweedy there, um, co-host of Australian Idol premiering Monday, 30 January, 7.30 p.m. on 7 and 7 Plus. Looking forward to it. That's it for this podcast. For the latest news podcast, streaming info and ratings, head to tvcentral.com.au. Until next time, I'm Aaron Ryan. Thanks to Scott Tweedy. Bye for now.